Hey everyone, on the next episode of Noon, meet James, an intrepid firefighter, seasoned podcaster, and published author. James is more than a firefighter. He's a dedicated advocate for mental health and physical well-being within the first responder community. His podcast and written work serves as powerful platforms, weaving narratives that go beyond the flames and sirens. Tune in for a compelling conversation as James unravels the layers of his firefighting experiences, podcasting adventures, and his passionate commitment to the holistic welfare of first responders. This episode promises a unique blend of bravery, storytelling, and advocacy that defines James' impactful journey. Let's get started. Okay, James, thank you so much for joining us on the Noon Podcast today. How are you doing? I am doing very well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Um, Can I go ahead and get an introduction? Absolutely. So, very long story, very short. I was born and bred in England, son of a veterinary surgeon, um, and... uh, wanted to be a firefighter when I was very young was told by my school I was colorblind and could never be a pilot firefighter or anything cool like that fumbled around for a long time um, ended up working in the stunt industry which took me to to Japan and ultimately America and I challenged the whole color vision thing uh, realized I wasn't color blind I was color deficient Um, joined the fire service um, let me see 2003 2004, I was first hired, worked for 14 years, and um, about seven years ago, started the Behind the Shield podcast. That's a a brief kind of overview. I want to discuss a little bit about what you've talked about already, because you have some very interesting topics. First of all, you were a stunt guy? Yes. Yeah. Still, I mean, still am technically. I worked right until, I forget, yeah, about about a year ago now, but I did the, they have a Jason Bourne stunt show in Universal, and I was doing that, so... It's always been my my uh, originally it was my career got back in well got into the fire service and then I just kept doing it as a side hustle. And was that something that you had to be an EMT to do, or did you just kind of fall into it? No, um, the backstory I I used to work on summer camps in America every summer, um, and it's kind of like an exchange program. And I met an English girl over there, and she was in drama school doing the costume and set design so the first year we were i mean it was like a long distance relationship and the second year to get closer to her i auditioned for the drama school having zero acting ability so i did some prep work got into a play before and i think because i was not your normal actor i was a martial artist and some other things so brought something different to the table I don't think it was my acting that got me into the school. I think it was just a different look, to be honest. <laughs> um, and then got in, got in there. So, but what happened? I discovered that I am actually an absolutely awful actor, but physically, the stunt side, so the stage combat, the swords, I excel at. So, that ended up taking me down um, a path as a stuntman, which I absolutely loved. Yeah, no, that sounds super cool and super fun. Um, so then you mentioned that you're not colorblind, but you're color deficient. What's the difference? So this is the thing. It's, it's funny because I wonder how many people that would have been phenomenal in certain professions never did it because someone in a white coat and a stethoscope told them they couldn't. Yeah. Um, the difference between color vision, you know, perfect color vision and color blind is the same as, you know, legally blind in 2010 or 2015 there are all these nuances in the middle. And so I have a red green deficiency. So I wouldn't be the best fashion designer, but you know, (laughs) as you know, we go on the car and it's like, then it's in the chartreuse car. Like, no, it's the green car. I I can tell that, but if it's slight difference of shades, if someone says maroon, maybe I'll kind of confuse it with a brown or something. But overall, the person that's screaming is probably the one that you need to help. You know what I mean? So, (laughs) but I'm not seeing gray. I'm seeing colors, just not, quite as vivid as some people oh that makes sense and that is quite interesting i i can't believe the doctor told you you couldn't do anything um as far as being a pilot or a firefighter that's so crazy that's crazy to think that that's something that would affect you because it's not really i mean i guess maybe were they concerned about driving like through the lights or you know 
it's i'll give you a perfect a, a comparison actually in the fire service we do a thing to get hired a lot of departments that is known as the minnesota personality interview test i always get the the name wrong but that's something like that and that is what they use to determine if we are going to be a good firefighter or, or become ineligible for the application and that test is completely bogus same as a polygraph like there's no science at all to show that that test on its own has any validation as far as someone's kind of fit for duty for those professions but they've used it because someone did once and they were like oh we'll just keep doing it and I've asked many, many people in the psychology and psychiatry field about this test, and they all said exactly the same thing. The little color vision books that we have, um, you know, again, you can see what kind of deficiency someone has. Well, what they've done is they've gone years ago to the, to the medical people and like, oh, yeah, they just pass or fail. Well, it's not pass or fail. You know, just because you can't see all the numbers doesn't mean that you're seeing black and white, you know, so... If I was literally seeing black and white and I've got firefighter friends that do, you know, they know that the red, you know, is the top light and the yellow is the middle light. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's still other ways of, of seeing that, you know, is it going to be a little bit more complicated? Yes. But we've got, you know, firefighters that have, you know, amputees that have gone back to work. We've got firefighters with cochlear implants that have gone back to work or, or been hired. So I think 2024 we're in now learning from the adaptive community realizes that man we we were so short-sighted in a lot of things and even if you look at the background checks you know you've got a, a candidate that wants to be a medic or a firefighter um you know and they were caught with weed when they were younger or yeah. got a speeding ticket oh you're disqualified well they're probably going to be great candidates because let's be honest we're not choir boys and choir girls when we're younger a lot of no. us which is what <laughs> makes us good for this job you know so um it's interesting when i look back now and that was kind of the british school system there wasn't this kind of american you can be anything it's it really was like yeah you're not going to really be much of anything so uh you had to really kind of break that mold and start learning to think for yourself yeah no for sure and i think that uh, a lot of people kind of see emts and paramedics as kind of the misfits of the group one of the funny memes that i see floating around right now is like I'm one of those messy kids with a messy backpack and I'm in the ER now, you know, <laughs> like that kind of a meme. And it's so true because you think about it and you're like, oh yeah, that was me. ADHD at its best, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I grew up on a farm, you know, so there was no, you know, uh, surgical precision. I was living, you know, literally, I remember being told off in school when I was in junior school, um, you know, at, accused of watching television that's why i was sleepy well no we were up lambing lambs at two in the morning you know so yeah you know a lot of us had a version of chaos and were able to succeed and now you go into a profession where surrounded by chaos and you're able to succeed you know some of our personalities actually fit well so uh you know we've all got a place within these professions but yeah you know, we are the weirdos and, and we should be proud of it. <laughs> I agree. We definitely are the weirdos. So you're in a position now where you are mostly focusing on doing this podcast, right? You're not working as a firefighter right now. No, I am not paid to be a firefighter. I love the Marine philosophy. Like you'll always be a firefighter. You'll always be a paramedic. I'm still, my, my medic license is still, you know, kept up to date. And I just did uh, worked a cardiac arrest on the plane a few weeks ago as a passenger. So, you know, that's, that's never going to go away. But, uh, yeah, I did transition out, found myself at a crossroads. The last department I worked for, I spent five years trying to make positive, proactive change. And let's just say there was a lot of resistance in mm -hmm. that particular culture. And so rehabbed a meniscus tear after surgery, got to a crossroads and realized that the podcast was having a big impact and it was that kind of force multiplier um philosophy that the green brace talk about you know you, i could sit on a seat on a rig and respond with a crew to one call at a time or i can try and advocate for all the first responders who then in turn are going to go on thousands and thousands and thousands of calls so i was not ready to leave the fire service but it was more the universe kind of told me hey this is and they put me in a department that i didn't want to stay working for which is which was genius because then it really <laughs> made the jump so i i made a jump a leap of faith um cashed out my retirement gave myself a salary for a year and change 
hoping that I would at least be able to fund this at some point um, and just did this all in and uh, I got no regrets whatsoever. And do you mind if I ask how that's working out for you? Yeah, it's it's terrifying. Um, <laughs> Understandably. You know, like one, you know, it's feast and famine. One minute you've got sponsorship and, you know, everything's good and then a pandemic comes through and then the ripple effect is companies are terrified and now no one's got the budget for anything. But um, that's why people don't do it because it is scary and there's nothing you know more comfortable than working for government and having mm -hmm. a pension and having health care um but <laughs> at the same time waking up in my own bed now you know um and walking the walk and i talk about a lot of the health issues when you leave the fire service partly because you know it is doing what it's doing to you and trying to be the example and then trying to push change for other generations um, you know, I know I'm, I'm doing the right thing for my family. I mean, I'm home with my son all the time now and he's 16, so he's not going to be here, you know, forever. Yeah. He's going to be off doing his own thing. Um, yeah, the, 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 the pros for, you know, outweigh the cons. Do I miss the fires and the codes and all those things? Absolutely. But as you know, the moment my seat is empty, another body fills it. So it's really my ego. I've got a temper from that side. I'm proud of 14 years. Um, and then this is the next chapter to to really fight for the mental and physical well-being of the men and women that leave their families and for the well-being of their families um and you know serve their community community so selflessly so that's the the kind of shift in mission still doing exactly the same thing just wearing different clothes now sure and it seems like you are making a really big impact because i was i was reading your your webpage and you talked about having uh, millions of downloads. So people are listening to what you're putting out there. Seems that way. <laughs> what really prompted you to push for the, the mental health aspect? Um, well, the origin story of the podcast is sad. I mean, it's, it's 10 years, roughly 10 years into my career, just shy of that. I just started going to funerals, funeral and funeral and funeral. And it was, you know, some firefighters were in their fifties. One was in his twenties, early twenties, Carl Andriano. Mm -hmm. And it was cancer and stroke and heart disease and uh, you know overdose and suicide. It was all the things, which is something I point out. Firefighters don't die of one thing; we die of everything. You know, whatever gets us first. So, with the background of being an athlete, being a coach, and then being an exercise physiology grad, I had enough knowledge to know what good information should look like. I was far from being the expert myself. To this day, I'm not an expert in anything, but. I knew what we, sh the kind of information we should be getting. Um, and so I just want to be part of the solution. And initially I was just looking for a podcast that someone else already had that was talking about firefighter wellness consistently, not just, you know, once in a while. And it, uh, seven years ago, there wasn't one, not that was, you know, uh, that had longevity at least. And so it was kind of that sign of, right, well then I guess it's you then. So that was it. It was just, I was just tired of hearing bagpipes and you know last calls and the bells and, and to this day i can't listen to bagpipes anymore i just freaking hate them but um that was it so we're reactive in uniform i wanted to be proactive i wanted to bring the real experts because in our profession some of us are pretty well versed in fitness or nutrition or mental health but it's not what we do for our whole career so the real experts are outside the fire service we just have to accept that so I wanted to find the best strength and conditioning coaches, nutritionists, and then the some of the you know highest performers, Navy SEALs and SAS, and you know all, all the all the people, um, and then tell the human story as well. So get even further outside, and I have ballet dancers and models and child soldiers, and you know all the the other human beings that their story still aligns with us, no matter where they were born and what they ended up doing. So it started off as this tiny little snowball and now it's almost 900 episodes deep so it's uh you know i mean we're still here so it must be doing something right yeah no that's really impressive that's a, that's so many episodes um you posted the other day that you are starting to put a lot of your throwback episodes up and i could be wrong but i don't think i am and i'm really excited to talk about it but you got to interview john travolta is that correct i did yeah um he, he oh, actually man. came to the house uh, oh he... my gosh so he's known for having this living in this housing development where there's a you can fly you know your garage has your plane in it um and that's in ocala just north of town here so 
I was lucky in that where firstly he did ladder 49 so there mm -hmm. was a, a connection to the fire service secondly after that film he actually donated uh, I think it was like fifty thousand dollars for a detox program for city of Ocala firefighters here so there's the altruistic arm and so through a mutual friend at the time I was able to connect with him and he was yes you know like almost immediately once we actually had the proper connection and it was a great conversation because he kind of walked through his early acting life and some of the kind of interesting stories from around Greece and things. But then hearing him talking about, you know, being trained as a firefighter for the for the film, um, you know, where he succeeded and where he failed. You know, he's quite humble saying that there were some things I couldn't do, you know, and his admiration for what we do was was pretty cool to hear. But yeah, I mean, another good human being. That's my prerequisite is just good people. Some of them are famous. Some of them are infamous. <laughs> then, you know, a lot of us are, are just, you know, regular Joes that are out there doing the job. But, you know, I don't let fame deter me from someone who's a good person that I'll try and get on the show. No, that's fantastic. And what a really cool story. I, I, I'm going to date myself here, but when Ladder 49 came out, I was in, you know, the first couple of years of my fire service and that was like the movie, you know, <laughs> everybody was excited to watch that one. So that was really cool. I'll tell you a funny story quickly, I'll just jump in there. So Ladder 49 came out right when I graduated the city of Hialeah's academy. So it was that orientation I got hired and I didn't really know too much about the film. I went with my, my now ex, but my wife at the time and you know, at the end, she's just bawling, like, yeah. oh, you're going to die. And I'm like, don't worry about it. He was on a truck company. I'm on an engine. and It'll be fine. <laughs> I didn't tell her a year later when I went to California that I was a truck company for, you know, several years after yeah. that. So, uh, yeah, I kept that quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a smart, smart thing to do. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, some of those guys and some of you guys, man, you guys do some crazy <laughs> stuff. It's really cool, though. You talked a little bit about how in your first 10 years, it was really sad because of all the death that you were seeing. And it's it's interesting that you talk about the death that you were seeing amongst your peers and colleagues. And in that, do you feel like you had developed any sort of PTSD from some of the patients that you might have transported or seen? So it's interesting when we talk about this. And the reason being, there is definitely trauma in, in my early life. Um, I, was, <laughs> I wrote a book three years ago, and I, I've said this a lot on, on interviews, but I genuinely forgot that I was in a house fire when I was four and I almost died, like forgot for decades. I, my complete fire service never even registered that, oh, maybe this is partly why he became a firefighter. So I'm writing this book and all of a sudden these things are starting to un unlock in my mind. Um, but yeah, so there was that. We uh, we also we were at a pub in England and I can still see this this guy to this day, but we were at this pub and there's this huge wall, you know, like um, they call it the recess wall, is that what they call it? But it was holding yeah, it up wall. anyway, all this dirt, yeah. And then there was a, t <laughs> a guy at the top and he was just digging, he was gardening, one of those little garden forks. And all of a sudden we're in the car and we talked about going back into the pub for us to pee. And then we were like, no, 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 we'll just go. So we just were pulling out of this parking space and there was this crack, massive crack and these boulders that were holding this earth up because it was I mean, i'm sure it looked bigger you know when i was younger but it, i mean thinking about it probably 25 feet of you know a massive uh limestone block and there's this crack and all of a sudden these these just came tumbling down like jenga and every car behind us that we were looking at was crushed down to you know where where the seat would have been at least and then this wave of limestone then took us up my dad gunned it and it just missed our car. So we were literally seconds from being killed then. Um, but that doesn't register as much, you know, when you're little. Um, but then there was a divorce when I was like in my teens by that point, my parents. But I think where I was so, so lucky, and this is nothing to do with me. It wasn't a conscious thing. It was just pure, you know, gamble luck is on the other side of the conversation. I grew up on a farm. So I have nature, I have exercise. Um, people are coming through our farmhouse all the time. Clients of my dad's, um, like I said, he's a veterinary surgeon. So from horse vets, excuse me, horse clients to small animals. And so meeting all these people is kind of a community element. Um, there's the healing that he's doing. You know, he's fixing these animals. Um, the blood and gut side, I'm helping him with surgery since I was tiny. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I look back now, 
just by chance, I think I was given as many healthy coping mechanisms alongside the bad stuff. So I think that's why even through my career, I never found myself in a really dark place. There were times after my divorce that was, it was rough. I was low, but never the depths that, you know, you and I have heard from some of our guests, you know, that are suicidal, deep in addiction, those kind of areas. And I think that's just a testament to the fact that there are some very healthy coping mechanisms. And if you weren't fortunate enough to just fall upon them as a child, like I was, you can lean into them now as an adult understanding time in nature exercise community you know mindfulness breath all the things that we know now work well and do you think that's something that you realized as you were going through your career or do you think it's something that you realized post-career post-career 100 percent. like i 900 interviews means 900 people way smarter than me that i'm trying to be quiet and listen and learn from so now seven years deep with all this wisdom i've slowly peeled the onion you know for myself and obviously just in general and so now you know i have a much better understanding i'm still not an expert i would never people say oh you should go out and talk i'm like i'm never going to talk because this is not my life's work i would literally be regurgitating other people's life's work so they can do the speaking and i'll just point people to them and say that's who you need to listen to but um but yeah, so I think that that was it. It's a slow learning, a slow realization, a slow um, self analysis, and you're picking away. But what's so exciting is there is hope. I mean, for example, mental health healing. It could be ketamine and psilocybin and ayahuasca, mm -hmm. ibogaine. It could be diving and surfing and dogs and horses, talk therapy, EMDR. There, there is such a huge toolbox that most of us weren't aware of that just because you've tried, you know, therapy A, B, and C doesn't mean that, you know, E, F, and G aren't going to work for you. So that's a real kind of eye opener for me is how many more uh, uh, opportunities there are to heal than most of us realize. I think you mentioned quite a few of them. Uh, I think that there are a lot of people that aren't necessarily opposed to trying some of those treatments, but that might be afraid because they might lose their job if they try those treatments well this is there's a few things firstly i think the plant medicine uh kind of paradigm shift has begun and i know in the military they just got over a huge hurdle from what i understand um fire departments now are starting to get past the cannabis hurdle which i think is phenomenal not that so much for people that just smokes um cannabis and it absolutely is but more so for me for cbd that 0.4 percent of thc that's in hemp stopped so many people from using cbd but they would go and use you know prescription meds and alcohol because that's okay even though it's far worse so that's opening up you know now for us from the cbd thc side you've got psilocybin you know those kind of things mdma something that i was dis disqualified from one uh the very first fire department ever applied for I said, yeah, I've tried this a long time ago. And they were like, nope, you're disqualified. Well, that's really? now discovered to be amazing for yeah. mental health counseling. Um, so I think what we're going to see is a big paradigm shift. But in the meantime, for example, ketamine. Ketamine just got a, you know, some exposure. I think one of the guys from Friends that just passed, um, he they said he died from ketamine. Well, actually, if you look at his history, he's been battling addiction for a long, long time. It's like saying that, you know, a 350-pound, patient with COPD died from COVID, you know, no, that was, you know, probably the final nail in the coffin, but ketamine is actually a very safe drug that they use in anesthesia. But if you do it with counseling, it can be very, very effective as well. So while we're still struggling with prohibition and there are places you can do ayahuasca in the U S and people can message me and I can tell you where. Um, but if you're worried about that, the ketamine route is another great option that is legal and you know won't get you in any trouble. I've heard a lot, a lot about the ketamine stuff. Um, ayahuasca is one that you know you watch through like YouTube and documentaries and stuff, and you you learn a lot about it. I would be afraid to do that only because I think that I would have a really bad trip. Even if I had somebody walking me through it, I think I would still have a bad trip. I have a very vivid imagination, but have you gone through it? I haven't done ayahuasca yet. Again, I mean, honestly, I've 
I've trust me, I've had invitations to do all the therapies from the retreats to the Iowa, you name it. You better um, go do it. <laughs> well, here's the thing though, like on a, honestly, hand on heart, because I feel like I've processed a lot, I'm not trying to, you know, just shy away from it. But I know if, for example, if you go to ayahuasca, you've got to, you've got to go there with the right mindset. Yes. You've got to, as they say, give in to the medicine. Well, if you're not really struggling with anything then you know, that's my whole thing so the mdma led counseling i would love to do because i've experienced it on the kind of party side but i know how it feels and i know it does open me up um and you're not getting all the purging and stuff that, that goes with ayahuasca either yeah. so that's something i definitely would like to do just to kind of you know go back in time and because a lot of people you know there's things locked away that we had no idea and when they start yeah. kind of digging a little deeper and you know, i've got a friend that uh discovered sexual abuse and he's now in his 30s late 30s had no idea and it happened when he was when he was very young so that can you know absolutely be a power but i think whatever therapy you choose you do have to want to do it now where i began especially that's normally people that are, are hurting and by that point they're like i will try anything to get out of this so that's i think that offsets the fear because yes not everyone has a great experience and those bad trips are usually because you're, you know, you're purging, emotionally purging as well. But if you don't want to be there, it doesn't matter if it's the 12 steps or, uh, you know, Ibogaine, if you don't want to be there, well, that's, that's the, the wrong way to enter that program. So you've got to figure out your why and then figure out which therapy, you know, seems like it'd be the best fit for you to try. Yeah, and there are a lot of good options. Do you know anybody who's offering the MDMA treatments? Um, I don't at the moment. I know the one that does ayahuasca, they're looking to do that soon. I know in the UK, sadly, it's only um, studies, you know, university studies that do it. Um, but I think it's something that we're going to see very soon. And again, you're talking about clinical dose, MDMA-led counseling. You go in, you take the drug when you're there. You have a counseling session when you're there. You're not prescribed. You don't take a bunch of, you know, MDMA with you to take home. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's like one week, two weeks, and then six weeks, if I got that right. And then the success they've had after that, that's it. You're done. And then it just keeps getting better and better and better because MDMA and ayahuasca, you know, psilocybin, some of these things, they're just simply opening doors. Now, if you just do the thing and you're not you with a counselor or a shaman, mm -hmm you're not really doing anything with what you discover behind that door. But if you combine the two, now it becomes very, very effective from what I've seen. But you look at like Joe Rogan and all of the guys that he hangs out with and they've had crazy amounts of like ego death trips, you know, like just going in balls to the wall, taking as much as they can just to trip. I, I don't know how anybody has the trust to do that. <laughs> no, no, but everyone has their thing. Like yeah, I, that is true. I have such a low tolerance, even for marijuana. I advocate for it. I don't, I don't do marijuana because it just, I don't like the way it makes me feel, but I have never cut a family out of a car because a stoner killed them. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if yep. it's something that's going to be an alternative to, to um, alcohol for someone to help them sleep and, um, you know, if it's if it's part of a CBD profile and it's helping them, um, there's so much good that comes from T THC. I mean, pediatric seizures, um, you know, people that are having issues eating, whether they're anorexic or whether they're on chemo, you know, that can create the appetite again. So to demonize something that works so well just because I specifically don't like it, again, is, you know, is selfish. So, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all for anything that works as long as it doesn't hurt people, which obviously we know alcohol, cigarettes, those do. So let's start advocating for the things that are actually healing. Sure. No, my wife has a, a really bad form of psoriatic arthritis and she use, she has a med card for marijuana and it makes her feel better. She gets up and she cleans and she does things where normally she can't because it's too painful in all her joints. So I'm a huge advocate for it as well. So much so that I have been drug tested multiple times at jobs <laughs> because I advocate for it, but it is what it is. I, I do think that there are really good things that we're finding in our studies with microdosing and stuff, and I hope that continues to progress. And I hope that one day it also progresses um, up through the federal level. Yeah, I think it will. Enough of us, you know, there's a term I like using to get people educated and angry. 
not just angry, you know, <laughs> not angry about some person that got voted in every four years that has no business being there. And I'm talking about every four years over and over and over again, both sides of the aisle. Yes. <laughs> like arguing over people that, you know, is not a fair system that chooses real leaders. That's yeah. silly. But getting educated and understanding and advocating for, or, you know, whether it's clean food and PE programs in our school or, you know, more stringent uh, driving tests so we make our roads safe, like things that actually make a difference, that's where we need to apply our energy and stop fighting over, you know, whatever the latest divisive thing is. Yeah, no, I agree, 100%. So you had talked about uh, working a code just recently, and you and I had talked on the phone, I think, like, literally days after you had gone through this event. <laughs> Do you want to share what happened? Yeah, it was interesting. I like sharing the story just because it was such an interesting um, kind of perspective that I got. 14 years, I've always worked in the very, most of my career in the very desperate parts of town. Um, very, very high call load, um, you know, seeing a lot of a lot of death in general, you know, whether it's just because people aren't very well off and therefore their living conditions are lower and you know, so they they die of all the things and sometimes they're not discovered for days and then you've got the crime and all that stuff in those kind of areas too. So for 14 years, you know, I worked on the kind of rigs um, where you, know, you have a horrible call and you clean off your gear and dispatch chirping at you, get back in service. And so you don't have the time to even think about it, you know, and you just jump back in and off to the next one. Then I transition out. Um, I volunteered for an absolute heartbeat and realized that it was just, I felt like a medic right along you know i didn't feel like a part of the crew and that wasn't that wasn't their fault i just it i was a fire a real firefighter all in firefighter and so the the volunteer extra set of hands model here just didn't fit me at all so apart from just doing my my research i really didn't have a lot of exposure i'd had things on planes but it was normally like a kind of version of syncope so i'd go there i would do a work up on someone but it wouldn't really you know saving a life or doing anything als um and then a few weeks ago, I'm on the tarmac, just about to taxi out from London to go back to America. And there's a commotion and I run back there and there's a dude face down on the floor or right between, you know, on the aisle between the seats. And uh, no one else seemed to really be from the pre-hospital world. There was a lady that helped that was a nurse, but I don't think, I'm 99.9% .9 sure she wasn't an ER nurse or, or that version. Um, but absolutely was right there trying to help. So, uh, you know, we started compressions and then the poor cabin crew, you know, they had to get permission for every single piece of gear. So it was taking them a long time. Initially, I was just handed an O2 tank and with that went up to five liters and a non rebreather, um, <laughs> which it wasn't very helpful. So we're doing compressions. Um, an AED did come and the first was actually a shockable rhythm. So we got one shock in a lady next to me randomly had a, a kind of um airway barrier you know one of those mouth-to-mouth -mouth barrier devices so we put it in and i'm like all right well it's good we haven't given him breath for a while so go i'm literally my lips are almost on this thing and someone says i've got it because i've been asking for a bvm and the bvm shows up and i'm oh, like oh thank goodness <laughs> so get rid of that bvm start bagging them as well um so anyway very long story short we're working it the fire brigade shows up I end up with one of the firefighters to drag the guy into the galley to give us more space to work. Then the London ambulance crew shows up because they're separate in England. Um, and I'm still on the chest. They they get an airway eventually because they had that eye gel, which actually one of the flight crew put in. So we were bagging through that for a bit. Mm. That came dislodged when we were dragging him. So then they got an airway in the galley. And so then I think I've been working it for probably 20 minutes by that point. I switch off with one of the firefighters on the chest and the galley is full of people by this point. And so I say, look, you know, I'm kind of in the way now. Do you, do you want me to stay or, you know, are you good? And they're like, oh, we're good. We'll just come get you um, in a little bit. Unlike on the rescue where you're cleaning off your stuff, you may be talking to the doctors and nurses. Hey, did you, you know, find anything on this patient? Kind of follow up, talking to your partner. Man, that was crazy. Did you see that dog? You know, all, all the things that you do, you just... I washed the blood off my hands in the airplane toilet and I just went and took a seat again. And then I'm sitting there and it kind of shook me a little bit. And I'm like, man, this is weird. You know, how, how am I, you know, feeling this? I did it for 14 years. And then as it goes on, the, the 
couple of the steward, um, the flight crew end up going home and I'm, you know, uber proud of them for doing that, for identifying that they just were shaken up by it. Um, and then the rest of them stayed and I ended up getting upgraded. They put me in first class. They had a, a seat, which oh. was perfect, not, <laughs> not for my comfort, but because that's where they were all staging. So I got to talk to all the cabin crew too. And, you know, with, with the lens that you and I have, be able to talk to them. Okay. You know, this is what you're feeling. Yeah. Don't feel bad. Normally I don't come back, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so it, for a couple of days, it kind of bothered me a little bit. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? And then I had an epiphany. I'm like, oh, this is what it feels like. This is what it's supposed to feel like when someone dies that you were trying to help. But we don't have time to even feel. We just yeah. get back to service and then go. Or, you know, the code happens at 6 a.m. You get off at 8. And now, well, I got to go home. And you're just driving home. So it was a really interesting insight into when we start struggling when a call kind of shakes us a little bit that's nothing wrong with you that's just the humanity peeking its head for a second and saying hey this you know you you felt like a real person for a moment and then you shove it back down and you're like i haven't got time for this but it, it and i shared that story because i thought it was important um you know we are supposed to be shaken when someone dies in our arms you know what i mean that inability to save mm -hmm. So when that rears its head, don't chastise yourself. Don't feel guilty and feel like you're weak. Just understand that it's your it's your humanity showing its face for a second before you have to put it down and get back into work mode. So that's uh that's my flight story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good one. It, uh, some of us, I wouldn't say it's lucky, but some of us just happen to see more death like that out in, you know when we're off duty than when we are on duty. I, my family can tell you multiple times of me stopping the car or pulling over because we saw a wreck or we saw somebody that, you know, looked like they were injured or in trouble on the side of the road or whatever. And it's really funny. I mean, it sounds like to me, you had a really good interaction with that fire crew and they, they kind of respected what you were doing and what you had done, where most of the time, my interactions when I'm rolling up on somebody like that, fire service, EMS comes up, PD comes up and they're like, oh, okay, okay, you're a bystander, like go away. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. well, yeah, and I think you're right, because I've had that, you know, I've responded also lots of times, you know, wrecks and stuff on the side of the road. And sometimes it's good, but yeah, and you know, we're all there. I, I think it's again, back to that mode, another call, another person, Yeah. you know? And so I put my hand on my heart. I'm sure I haven't been as, as thankful and understanding myself when I've come on some calls. But I think what was what was interesting is, you know, this crew was, I'm assuming, based at the airport. The fire service in London is separate from EMS, so they're not doing medical like we do in America. So, you know, I think they were glad <laughs> there was someone else <laughs> who oh, that's good. Know, was, was, was a paramedic. And then when the other medics came, you know, when I gave them the kind of pass on, I think they must have been like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, so there was that level of respect, but you're right. I think in the States and I will put myself in this, sometimes we just kind of jump off the rig and go into go mode and occasionally kind of run through someone that's done an amazing job and has helped up to that point and probably ruffle feathers or at least leave them feeling kind of, uh, underappreciated, you know, sure. so, so I think it's a good, good lesson for us all to remember that. Yeah, no, and it happens. Um, did you, did it make you miss the fire service at all? When I moved, when I left? No, when you, like, when you were actively doing this code, were you, like, upset that you didn't get to transport with this patient or that you didn't get to, like, see the outcome? Um, I think I would love to have known the autopsy results. Like, was this person savable? Because um, I've, I don't know if we talked about it when you were on my show, but I've, been an absolute black cloud in my career and i've never in 14 years as an emt and ultimately a medic and i'm part of these other crews you know it's not just my hands but never had a code save 14 really? years no never and this was another another person on that list um so uh um so yeah knowing i would have loved to have known yeah there was no getting him back and he had that i'm not coming back look i mean he was face down you know um, his eyes were just, you know, just got that look where, where it was beyond, beyond saving, but to have that confirmation probably would have been nice, but we don't normally get that even when we're, you know, on the job. So, yeah, but it didn't, 
I didn't have that feeling of missing it because again, circling around to what I'm doing now, you know, the the, the glory of of a save still doesn't outweigh trying to help thousands and thousands and thousands of responders through, you know, all the the conversations. So, you know, we depending on where you're at. I mean, I ran a lot of codes where I was, um, but you know, there's so much nine one one abuse as well. Even mm -hmm. you know, we call the good calls, which is a bad call for someone, you know, themselves they're not every call you know you're wading through a lot of bs to get to these ones where you're really making a difference so um no i'm i'm at peace sleeping in my own bed now but uh <laughs> but i do miss you know loading hose after a great fire or cleaning the saws or you know even even god forbid cleaning the back of a rig after a trauma alert or something as terrible as it was for that person you know knowing that you guys worked together and did everything you could to try and save that person that's that's a feeling few people will ever understand yeah, no, I, and I think you described it well. I think those those tasks that we do when we complete those missions that we're on is therapeutic, right? It is very therapeutic. I remember pulling the broom out and scrubbing the five inch, you know, after you've been fighting all day, right before you load it back up or the inch and three quarters or whatever you end up doing. And I think we take advantage of it at the time because we don't think about it. But that is the time when you're, you know, you're bullshitting with your crew and you're talking shit to each other or you're talking about the call or whatever you happen to be doing and that's uh it's something that i miss these days <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i was just talking to someone um he's a former police officer that was shot and he actually had ptsd so bad it, it took him out of the job completely but um we were talking about dispatch because that's what he did first for a uh, campus police organization and um they are the unsung heroes of the first responders and where I think we really let them down, I say we obviously, you and I aren't in charge of you know creating a dispatch yeah. center, but <laughs> you think about it, they're in there for 12 hours. So they probably come in in dark or dusk or dawn, whenever they start and leave the same kind of conditions. So they're barely seeing any daylight. Um, you know, there's the inactivity, but also if we get a call and you know whatever the acuity is, you're going to go in, you're going to do CPR, you know, you're going to be lifting patients or you're going to be pulling hose, throwing ladders, you know, using extrication tools. There's a physical exertion that goes along with the stress with the dispatchers. And I had, uh, I've had a few, but one of them was Beth Bauer Sox, who was a dispatcher for the Paradise Fire that killed all the people in California. And that, and she lived in Paradise. Oof. And so she was getting these phone calls like the fire's coming, help me, help me, you know, and they don't have a way of offloading. So no. we've got to think about that, you know, the the loading the hose and cleaning the tools after a physical exertion on the call. We have to figure out a way where we can get our dispatchers outside moving so they can offload some of their stress when they have some of these, you know, more uh, high stress calls, because otherwise all that cortisol and stress just kind of stays within them. You know, and I think a lot of dispatch centers, you see the same kind of physical ill health because they're getting all that stress you know, no, no movement, no exposure to daylight. Um, and a lot of them are just like the rest of us, you know, understaffed. So they end up being forced to extra shifts too. So it's a group that we need to talk about and bring into the conversation. I agree. And I appreciate that you're pointing that out because it is a, a very underrepresented group. You know, it's a, it is unfortunate because while we do think about them a lot, they are one of the first people or groups of people to get shit on, right? Because they, they sometimes have had bad representation by the calls that are recorded and they can get called out on that. But in those couple of bad recordings, we're missing the hundreds of thousands of calls that went really well. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you get this them and us, you know, yes. I remember going on, on a hemorrhage and I got there and it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Well, yes, there was a hemorrhage. And at first you're like, what the, you know, this is a dangerous scene. How could they mess up? And then, you know, you take a step back and go, well, they only had whatever information they were given by whoever made that phone call. Yeah. And you got to remember that if the patient, you know, the person says, oh, there's a guy bleeding. Well, that's all they're going to able to tell us that if he didn't hear a bang and see a gun lying next to him, the the bystander that made the phone call is setting the dispatcher up for failure, which then carries on through to us. Yep. No, very true. Very true. Um. So do you feel comfortable talking about maybe one or two of the worst calls that you went on in your career? Um, yeah, I can relay, um, which I wrote about in my book, 
the last day I worked for Orange County, and this wasn't the why it was the last day, but um, so it wasn't a bad call. It was a bad day because it's funny. You know, this is a a question that we're you know we're asked, and funny enough, mm-hmm. I haven't actually been asked it that much. Usually, it's in conversation with fellow fellow first responders, which you know we're okay talking to each other about it. But for me, it's like you know, which one? You know, do you want a baby? Do you want you know? Be more mm-hmm. specific. I have so many. Which yes, <laughs> you know, tell me what. What kind of horrible call you want to hear? Because uh, there's, you know, sadly, there's so fucking many. No, I believe it. But the last day, though, so I, the, the reason why it was my last day, Orange County at the time, they were mandatorying us like every, you know, literally every week or so. Um, and I was a single dad, and so to be told you can't go home when you're a single parent is unacceptable. So. It was also a department where you're on the rescue all the time. And I was, you know, a driver I could ride up. And so we we run a um, a cardiac arrest with another crew, end up working this guy, GI bleed, another one doesn't come back. Clean up from there, get back to the station and they're like, oh, you're on the rescue again. We need you on the rescue now. And by the way, you're going to be mandatory in the next shift. And I'd actually been testing for a different department because of the, you know, the family dynamic and the situation. And I wasn't all the way through yet, but I'm like, you know what? I just hit, I hit the wall. I'm like, I'm done. So I went back and typed an email with my resignation right there and then, um, because I was just sick of the organization side. It was nothing to do with the, the calls. Um, so I had my notice in like nine, and I say, you're not getting two weeks notice because you're not going to replace me in two weeks. So let's just say I won't be here next shift. <laughs> let's be realistic. Um, so then about. To like mid afternoon, and it's the summer in Florida. We get a call, and there's a homeless lady that's been reported missing. They haven't seen her in a few days. And so we start searching this area of the woods, um, smell her before we see her. I end up just telling the rest of the crew, look, just stay here. We don't all need to see whatever it is. I'll let you know if you know if there's anything that we need. Um, so I keep going, end up finding what's left of her, just kind of rotten, hanging off her bones. Um, so that's person number two later in the shift go to bed get banged out like two in the morning um for a structure fire and i'm on the rescue that day we're all bunkered up with my partner she's driving into the emt and i hear one of the rescues that's from that first jew screaming out for help saying they got a patient so we're south of the fire we end up saying well we'll come to you so we go to them rather than the actual fire itself and uh this guy i don't know if it was a suicide attempt or arson gone wrong but he had come out of the house completely on fire like engulfed in flame they had uh put him out i think one of the crews had put him out and so when i get there he's leaning against the fence just steaming um you know third degree burns head to toe um you know it's a if we're going to really illustrate it, I mean, the poor guy had no nose, no lips, no eyes, no ears, you know, like, I mean, f- horrendous, horrendous burns. So we end up doing, I leap the fence, do a standing, take down the ba- backboard, slide him over to the other side, get him on the stretcher. Um, and then now we're hauling us and it wasn't too far from the hospital and we don't have RSI in Orange County because I think the proximity for the, we have loads of hospitals and they're usually pretty close. So I'm just getting ready to intubate. And uh, my partner, almost out of habit, just starts doing the the report and asking him for his name you know, to get some information before we get there so he's not a John Doe. And this guy responds as clearly as I'm talking now. Mm. And so we just look at each other like, what in the... And the only way to describe it, and I'm not a big... I'm not a religious person. I am spiritual somewhat, but the only way to describe it is his body, his spirit didn't know that his body was already dead because anatomically nothing on his face wasn't completely burnt off. You know what I mean? No eyes, no tongue. So there's no way in hell that his airways weren't compromised, but he spoke as clearly as this. Now with no RSI, my only option now is to put a number of breather on him yeah. because I can't intubate. He's talking to me. Um, so uh you know luckily it was very close um try an io get the burn sheets on and so now we wheel this poor guy into the uh, er and you imagine the looks we get with a normal breather around his face yep and so when we get in i'm like just <laughs> just listen for a second he was talking as though i'm talking to you now and they're like you know this look of disbelief and then they ask him questions and then their faces all drop um and so yeah, and then by that point we've got him, you know, in in the good light now in the ER. I mean, it's it's 
just as we saw, I mean, uh, extremities are burned, you know, groin is burned off and it's just everything. The only thing that's not burned are the soles of his feet because he was obviously standing, you know, either deliberately or accidentally when all this thing kicked off. And he ended up passing away an hour later. So, and again, after that, we cleaned up and we went back in service. And the medic that I ran that fire with, I wasn't on this call but that day, but a car had run into a bus stop and dragged a woman underneath it. And I think I think she made it, but that was another one of his calls that day. And that's just a shift in the fire service. So even though, it, I mean, it bothered him, my partner, the other medic, um, it bothered him and he transitioned out of the fire service and I had lunch with him a few years ago. And yeah, I mean, when we talked about it, he kind of went ashen and it still, still was the big thing. But this is what I'm saying is like, you know, what's the worst thing? That was just a day. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and again, there's people have had far worse than me. And this is why when I wrote my book, it wasn't to pretend like I'd had some illustrious career. I hadn't. I had a very average career in the fire service. And this is what our men and women see day in, day out are these horrors and, you know, trying to just put their head down and move forward. But I mean, each one of these takes a little bit of piece of you. And if you're not finding the things that balance it and allow you to you know, kind of patch that piece back on, it's only a matter of time before these things start affecting you. Yeah, no, for real. And when I ask, because I recognize, you know, I, I am really blessed that people come onto my show and they share these really hard stories with me. And when I'm asking, you know, what your worst call is, I want to know what the call is that affects you personally, because you're right. We do see these things. We see a lot of these things all day, every day, some people, you know, more than they should, and some people not as much as other people, but we as individuals, something affects us differently. You know, one really dumb call that we think might be dumb affects us harder than that really gory call with the, you know, the lady that got dragged underneath the bus. There are just terrible, terrible things that we see and some that aren't so terrible that affect us so deeply so deeply but that sounds like that was a really rough day that wasn't it wasn't the best <laughs> yeah i'm sorry that you dealt with that i think some people are in scanty thought that that was why i quit but it wasn't i mean it, you know the, the, i had a, a young like i think she was three decapitation when i was in california and that one sucked because my little boy was about 18 months at the time sitting in the same kind of seat um and that one you know that that was if you ask which one hit me the hardest, it would be that one, you know, and again, didn't hold me, but what was interesting, having done this podcast for a while, I was at Disney with my family and uh, there was a blanket over this little girl when we got there, one of the, the engine crew had put it over her. And uh, so years later, it's really hot and someone's pushing their child when they put a blanket over the stroller and the same kind of looking little legs are poking out. And I just had a, adrenal like full-on wave and i told my wife i'm like oh let me just sit down for a second and that was it that was a little snapshot i got a you know 60 second window into what some of our you know men and women struggle with day in day out those flashbacks those panic attacks and it was just a you know it was, a, it was an adrenaline surge for a moment but I got to just peek in that window like god i can't imagine if that was like that all the time so even though that was the only time of you know arguably one of my worst calls because it was just so close to my son's age and such a horrible you know way to go as well um but you know just just seeing seeing the potential of what could happen what if my upbringing looked different i mean would i you know would i just be in pieces right now you know had my kind of uh formative years look different so um just i mean i've always had empathy but it just kind of reinforced the empathy for others having a little, little tiny taste of that myself well it's good that you were able to recognize that right because a lot of a lot of people don't get to recognize those feelings that some people have and there are still a lot of people that think it's just a bunch of bullshit you know and it's not so i'm i'm not glad that you felt it but i am glad that you are able to recognize and understand those feelings yeah no i'm glad i felt it you know i think you know some of these experiences they're important they're visceral you can't understand them unless you get you know an exposure so as long as they're not debilitating i think it's good you know to have, have experienced some of the suffering you know then you can be empathetic and relate to others you know 
So like I said, I'll never say, oh, I struggled and I was suicidal because I wasn't, and that would be a lie. But I can certainly empathize with the the depths of being a single dad working for a, one of the busiest rescues, working on one of the busiest rescues in Orange County, going to medic school with no support from my department, so having to ride with a completely different department. You know, I mean, just low, low, low times. But, um, you know, if I hadn't experienced that, could I sit in front of someone else who's, who's you know, suffering and struggling and truly empathize if I hadn't really been there myself? So, you know, some of these struggles can become a real superpower if, you, if you're able to navigate them and start growing from them. Sure. Yep. No, I agree. Um, so I want to give you the opportunity to talk about your book a little bit. What, uh, what prompted the book and what's the book about? So the book is called One More Light, uh, Life, Death, and Humanity Through the Eyes of a Firefighter. I took the first part of the title from the Lincoln Park song because, you know, I just love that. You know, who cares if one more light goes out in the sky of a thousand stars? I do. And it's, that's what we do. You know, we don't care, color, creed, whatever. Someone is hurting. Someone is struggling. We are going to respond. It's that simple. So I love that song. And it's obviously there's the the tragic element as well that he himself struggled with addiction and uh, you know mental health and ended up taking his own life um but this the book itself it's not a biography because again you know maybe one day I'll, I'll actually write a biography but for this time in my life i just wanted to impart a lot of the lessons that i've learned either personally and through all you know the wisdom that I accrued at that point through the podcast so i took stories from my career uh, career and life and just really, it's a bunch of short stories. So it will start with, you know, uh, she wrote about that one terrible day, for example. And then it'll go into mental health, you know, addiction, obesity, overcoming injury, all the things that we struggle with in the fire service. And I wanted to write it so they could do two things. People in uniform could really relate and understand that they weren't alone and they really identify with some of the things that they were struggling with and then find solutions because I'll talk about some of these great guests and you know where to find you know help for these things but also give the general public an insight into what we actually do because the kind of chess beating superhero facade that people like to project on us as we know is couldn't be further from the truth yes we do some heroic shit sometimes but ultimately we're normal people being asked to do extraordinary things you know we're just human beings so i wanted to to really educate the public and if they read it they go oh wow i didn't realize they did all these things well now you do so that was uh that was really why i wrote it um and uh, that was three years ago and i'm actually writing a second one now which is actually gonna be a fiction which i hope i can get made into a television show which is lofty goals but that is very not lofty. a lot of people it is but why not i mean i always say if tiger king could get made then anyone's story can get made so um but people a lot of people don't read and that's not no disrespect to them it's just you know it's an older medium if you think about it so the screen is really how you get to people so i'm gonna tell modern day firefighter stories but there's gonna be a multi-generational trauma element to it um and i want to i want to get it to made into a show so that then people will actually hopefully finally get um a television series that portrays firefighters the way that we actually are not just you know every code they end up jumping up and giving them a hug or yeah. every fire they get everyone out before the roof collapses but not doom and gloom but just more realistic um but then also kind of tell the origin story of addiction homelessness all the things that ironically in you know a pretty heavily faith-based country we can be very judgmental on people yes. who are struggling for some reason so that's that's kind of the the idea behind my second book that sounds amazing, and I I wish the best of luck to you. I would probably watch that show, <laughs> as yeah. long as you're not like shocking Asis Lee. I think we'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, I'm uh, uh, if it if I can write it and thus it's portrayed the way it is in my mind, I think it will be compelling for a lot of people. I'll just leave it at that. Well, I think you've proven already to a lot of people that you can do anything that you've put your ideas to being as far as you are with your career and coming up and doing the podcast and being successful in that. So congratulations to you. And I, I do think that if you want it to happen, it will happen. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I 
have the same kind of confidence and I have arrogance but as I said every single story that's out there and there are some phenomenal ones that I never would have been able to write but you know I think there is a yearning for good storytelling and there is a lot of bad television out there so hopefully just being one more good story that makes people think um, you know I think there's space for that I think there's a yearning for it too I think people are really starting to to yearn for the middle ground again to yearn for community and being brought together and and uh yearn for the kind of compassion love kindness that a lot of them read in their their holy texts um so yeah i think 2024 is going to be a good year it sounds like it and where can people find your book um i did the kind of amazon only publishing so amazon is the place to get it um i've got you know paper hardback and ebook and then i did actually narrate the uh audio book so that's on i think it's itunes or apple whatever um and then uh, audible as well so you can get it in all the mediums um i priced it very affordable and i made it i think it was 187 pages or something like that um so i made it short enough because i know for me being sleep deprived i just struggled to read when yeah. I was on shift, I was so tired all the time. So with these being more short stories, you can literally leave it in the toilet, you know, read one chapter while you poop <laughs> and, <laughs> and then come back to it next time. So you're not kind of going back going, oh, I've forgotten where I was in the story. Every chapter is a new story. So I try to make it kind of first responder friendly. I, I try to take quotes from each episode to make that the title. I will not make it. You can take it with you while you poop. You can if no, you want. I'm very tempted to. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. <laughs> um, awesome. And where can people find your podcast? So Behind the Shield um, is should be available everywhere except YouTube. Um, I love the video conversations. I always look at my, my um, guest and I use the videos for the promotion, but I know almost no one that will sit and watch a podcast and editing does take a certain amount of time and bandwidth um so i focus on the audio quality so everywhere that you listen to podcasts you can find it itunes spotify etc etc so it should be there i will give props to the first behind the shield before i started mine which is a kind of dungeons and dragons gaming type <laughs> podcast so you'll see them they've got a kind of wooden shield my one is a diamond with a axe and halligan black diamond but it's a uh, you know, it's got almost 900 episodes now, so it should pop up. If you just Google it, it should pop up at left, right, and center. Awesome, 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 and great stuff. I really enjoyed being on your podcast last week, and I look forward to listening to it. I won't lie, I haven't listened to it yet. <laughs> well, but let me ask you this. Did you get good feedback? Have your friends listened to it? I, you know what? I have been so busy today, I haven't even looked, so I will look, and I will let you know. Because <laughs> I'm curious, you know, for you, because I know that was your very first podcast that you were on. I thought you were great. So I got a funny feeling that your friends are going to say that you did a good job and, you know, get you doing more because uh, it was a great conversation. Oh, thanks. I, I really hope so. I really hope. So. I actually interviewed with uh, Chris Smetana the day after I interviewed with you, and we talked about compassion fatigue, and it was just an absolute blast. We had a great time. Brilliant. So I felt That's I felt a little more comfortable going into his after having yours. And then uh, I'm interviewing with the conversing nurse next month at some point. So fantastic. But uh, James, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out today. You know, the, the conversation was fantastic. You shared a lot of really great stories. I've had a really, really good time interacting with you over the last couple months. And I, you know, I look forward to talking with you and collaborating with you a little more. Absolutely, Sam. Thank you so much. You're doing amazing things. I mean, I've got so much respect for anyone who, you know, is doing it while they're un wearing uniform. They they came out of the uniform and they still wanted to help. But you know, this is this is it. We we react when we're at work, um, but there's so many opportunities for us to be proactive. And I think these conversations, your podcast, my podcast, um, just allow this this beautiful exchange of knowledge you know when there's just two of us talking the audience gets to listen you know and, and we as a society are really bad at interrupting so when i listen to other people's podcasts it i just have to be quiet and let them <laughs> you know let them talk and, and as a host as well like letting someone finish their entire thought process which you've done today so thank you allows us to really articulate our thoughts and all of a sudden there's a lot less miscommunication if you let people just simply you know finish what they were going to say so 
this is you know this is one of the the pieces of the tapestry that I think is going to move wellness in our profession. So thank you. I agree. No, thank you so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Before we wrap up, we have a few important announcements to share with you. Firstly, we're excited to announce the launch of our brand new 911 Nonsense Facebook group page. It's a community where everyone can go to connect, share ideas, discuss topics from the show, and get all of the most recent updates about the podcast. We'd love to have you join us and be part of the conversation. Next, we want to ask you to rate and review our podcast on your preferred platform. Your feedback means the world to us and helps us reach a wider audience. By rating and reviewing the show, you'll be supporting us in a big way and helping others discover 911 nonsense. If you enjoy what we do and would like to support the podcast even further, we have a few options available. You can visit samspursuit.com to find the links to our 911 nonsense merch page and our recently released noon gear page. Every contribution, no matter the size, goes a long way in helping us continue to better the podcast. We know that not everyone is comfortable being on the podcast, but we still want to hear your stories and experiences. If you have a compelling story and would like to share it to be read by me in a future episode, please reach out to us via email at 911nonsense at gmail.com or through our website's contact section. If you choose to be anonymous, we'll make sure to respect your privacy while sharing your story in a way that resonates with our audience. Thank you again for tuning in. We truly appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more engaging content in the future. See you next week.